Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. My name is Paul Harris and I'm president of the City Club's Board of Directors. I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker, Ari Shavit, winner in the nonfiction category for the 79th annual Annisfield Wolf Book Awards. Today's program is really a classic City Club forum with a distinctly Cleveland flavor and a topic with a profoundly international dimension. The Annisfield Wolf Book Awards were established in 1935 by Cleveland poet and philanthropist Edith Annisfield Wolf in honor of her father, John Annisfield, and her husband, Eugene Wolf. As stated at the awards website, the awards, quote, recognize books that have made important contributions to our understanding of racism and our appreciation of the rich diversity of human cultures, end quote. The Cleveland Foundation, the world's first community foundation, has administered the award since 1963. The City Club is very proud to partner with the foundation to provide a forum for winners of the awards. Now, I will certainly not do justice to the awards by selectively mentioning a few award recipients among a group of illustrious winners, but I'm going to mention two. One is the Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr., whose work, Stride Toward Freedom, the Montgomery story, won in 1959. And the second I'm going to mention is our speaker today. Mr. Shavit served as a young man as a paratrooper in the Israel, Israel Defense Forces and studied philosophy at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Since 1995, he has been a correspondent, columnist, and editorial board member of Haaretz, Israel's oldest daily newspaper. Mr. Shavit's book, My Promised Land, The Triumph and Tragedy of Israel, earned him the previously mentioned awards recognition. The book has certainly generated some strong reactions. In a New York Times op-ed last November, columnist Thomas Friedman wrote that, quote, the uniqueness of Shavit's book is that when you're done with it, you can understand, respect, or love Israel, but not in a dogmatic or unthinking way, and not a fake or contrived Israel, end quote. He also suggested it as must reading for President Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu. <laughs> in his book review, Oren Kessler of the Wall Street Journal wrote that, quote, quoted selectively, my promised land could serve as fodder for those looking both to flatter Israel and default it, end quote. But he adds, Mr. Shavit, quote, isn't selling the one on, on the one hand, on the other, equivocation of the self-conscious centrist. Rather, he is earnestly, painfully trying to grapple with the vexing complexities of Israel's past and present, end quote. And finally, in his New York Review of Books piece last month, Jonathan Friedland noted that my promised land has been attacked by both, quote, hawkish Zionists, end quote, and, quote, anti-Zionists, end quote, and sometimes, I would note, with very harsh language. Now, at the City Club of Cleveland, the Citadel of Free Speech, we often say that if you manage to anger both sides on an important issue, you may be doing something right. And you're probably engaging people to think a bit harder on a complex topic, which is really, when you think about it, what informed free speech is all about. So with that, I'm, in, I'm very pleased to introduce, on behalf of the City Club of Cleveland, Ari Shavit, award-winning author and senior correspondent at Haaretz newspaper. Thank you so much for inviting me, for being here. I'm once again moved by your amazing city and your amazing community and your civic spirit. You know, I come from the city that is the ultimate citadel city, Jerusalem, and I'm a deep believer in free speech. So to be attending the citadel of free speech is a great thing for me. My, probably one of my most important heroes as writers is Alex de Tocqueville and his great book about your great American democracy. And the main point for me in the book was that America, the greatness of American democracy is not just the Congress and the branches of government, but this civic society. That we have these civic associations throughout the country that maintain really the fabric and the heart of your democracy. And obviously what we see here is such an amazing manifestation of that. So I'm privileged to be your guest and to be part of you good people. I'm, as you probably heard, I've fallen in love with your city, 
and I'm quite amazed that there are still people who are still willing to have me here. <laughs> I must tell you that the people who brought me over, you know, make me work very hard, but yet I enjoy every moment of it. <laughs> So I apologize that I will really have to rush back right, right, right after we finish, but I'm really thankful for the astounding Cleveland Foundation and for the good people of the Ennisfield Wolf Award to have brought me here and to have given me this amazing experience of knowing your city. And let me tell you, I'm determined to be back. Let me begin with where I ended my talk last night. What I said at the end of my talk was that, basically, I'm a great believer in two things. I'm a great believer in the deep alliance between your great democracy and our frontier democracy. The American-Israeli alliance is not only a strategic one, it has to do with moral values, shared values, and a shared cause. But I'm also a believer in America. I admire America. I love America. And I think America is the only one that can lead this troubling world we live in. I've noticed with some worry in recent years that some Americans have lost some of that belief because of reasons which I understand all too well. Some of you have lost some of the confidence in your leadership and in your way, and we'll talk about that. But let me tell you, there is no other power, there's no other nation that can lead this world. So I wish to talk about it, but to convince you of really your great role in what you've done in the past and you must do in the future. This summer, this Middle East summer, was traumatic for both democracy. We had our own traumatic summer and you had your traumatic summer. We had rockets and tunnels. You had beheading. Who would have thought of it? Who would have thought of it just a year or two ago, or 10 years ago, that we'll once again see a medieval-like evil phenomena of beheading, and beheading of America of brave American journalists. So let me begin with talking about our traumatic summer. Some two months ago, just over two months ago, I realized what was about to happen. So I went into the room of my 10-year-old Michael and my 5-year-old Daniel. And I told them that in the coming days, they will hear something they've never heard before, the howling sound of sirens. Two days later, evening, we did hear the howling sound of sirens. We live in a nice suburban neighborhood near Tel Aviv. In every way, our life is like the American dream. And suddenly, in this American-like suburb, sirens. So as we walked down to the sheltered room, and I saw how shocked my sons are. And Michael asked if a missile might hit our house and destroy it. And Daniel asked if Iron Dome might break. And I watched them with deep sadness because I remembered other sirens of my life. In 1967, when I was nine, there was the terrifying, terrifying sound of the sirens when we really felt Israel is facing extinction. 
There were no settlements there. There was no occupation. And yet our neighboring nations wanted to destroy us, to eliminate the Jewish state, and possibly to kill its residents. We really feared a new Holocaust. And the world stood by. Our great foreign minister, Abba, even came to Washington, went to Europe. We asked the international community to take action. But no one took action. We were all alone. And it's only thanks to our own soldiers that we were saved. Six years later, the sirens were howling again as the 1973 war erupted. And that time, it was exactly the opposite. We were arrogant and self-confident at the time, but we were always almost lost at war. And we owe America a lot for saving us during that war. It was very different from then 67. In 1991, sirens again. By that time, I was a young man, young couple in Jerusalem. And I'll never forget the moment when I had to go down to help our neighbors who were Holocaust survivors, 80 years old, who escaped Auschwitz, went to Miami, but then decided to come to Israel. And when I had to help them put gas masks on their face, I was wondering about the fate of our people. How is it the people that had managed to escape that gas there had even the notion, the fear, of experiencing that again? So now, just two months ago, as I was watching my boys, I thought how sad it is that they and I also join this Israeli ritual of experiencing things that other children in the Western world do not experience. As I said, in so many ways, they are just like American kids. But they face something. There is a cloud over their head that, thank God, is not facing anyone in this country or in other democracies. So that was the experience we went through. You went through the experiencing of seeing these terrible, terrible, acts of brutality, of barbarism, that you could not respond to. There was no way to save your people from that new kind of evil. And one could have not escape the irony. We are today just one day after 9-11. So first you have the images of the Twin Towers falling. Then you have 13 years in which America does everything possible to fight terror, to destroy this kind of evil. But ironically, sadly, tragically, it all comes back. And now there are the two dead men that say so much about what America is facing today. So what is the significance of this summit? about both of our two democracies. We have to acknowledge, for one, that we all made great, deep mistakes in the last 13 years. I'm not into the blame game. Definitely, in, as an Israeli, I only am, have gratitude for America and admiration for America. I'm not into criticism. But I also urge Americans not to get into the blame game. One of the reasons for that, because everybody made mistakes. Americans made mistakes, Israelis made mistakes, Europeans made mistakes, Republicans made mistakes, Democrats made mistakes. The fact that what has begun with America going to Afghanistan to fight Al-Qaeda, and 13 years later, we find Al-Qaeda at the footstep of Israel, and soon in Europe, and God forbid, in America again. That shows you that something 
deeply went wrong in these years. And again, let's not get into the, I think we should unite facing this, not have these divisive arguments about who is to be blamed. But then there is the other thing to understand, which is we are facing regional brutality in the Middle East. Basically, what has happened in the Middle East is that the old corrupt order based on Western friendly dictators, whether monarchs or generals, has collapsed. But the result was not the emergence of anything benign, anything democratic, anything liberal. The result is a disturbing reality, not only for Israel or for America. I think of young Arab women and men. What are the choices facing them today? A reactionary monarchy? A military dictatorship? An Islamic theocracy? Or bloody chaos? We have to acknowledge there is a political Ebola in the Middle East. It's killing everything that is relatively healthy, and it's endangering anyone who looks for stability. It's one of the main challenges of this time. So let me get into the certain different points here. First of all, we must remember that the main challenge in the Middle East, with all due respect to ISIS, about what I'll say about it in a, few, in a few words soon. The major threat is the threat of a nuclear Iran. If, God forbid, Iran will go nuclear, the Middle East will go nuclear, and just imagine what will happen within all this chaos if you'll inject nuclear capabilities into this. If Iran will go nuclear, Saudi Arabia will go nuclear, Egypt will go nuclear, perhaps Qatar will go nuclear, Turkey, Algeria. We will have a multipolar nuclear system in the world's most unstable, violent region. I don't think the Iranians will throw a bomb on Tel Aviv the next day they have it. But just the emergence of this new phenomenon will definitely endanger Israel, but it will endanger America. I'm sorry to say that, but the next, if this will happen, the next 9-11 will not be a conventional 9-11. So Iran is a challenge to our civilization. And yet again, in the last decade, we all made major mistakes. And the Iranians are ahead in the game. If we do not wake up and deal with this major threat soon, our world will change. The impact of a nuclear Iran and a chaotic nuclear Middle East will not be felt only in Israel. It will be felt even in Cleveland. The second challenge is the one I roughly described, which is this Arab chaos, which is endangering all moderates in the region. Again, Israel just one of them, but endangering American interests. If some Americans, for good reasons, were fed up with the Middle East and thought they can go back home, count on energy independence, and forget about the world, the ISIS phenomena have proved how wrong these people are. There is no way to run away from the Middle East. And the chaos in the Middle East is a challenge to all of us. The third challenge facing us, and here Israel is in the front, is the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. This is a deep, existential, and dangerous conflict. And to say it briefly, because I, as I don't have to, time to get into the details, the basic catch here from an Israeli point of view is that on the one hand, we must act to change the status quo, because the present situation is endangering us demographically, morally, and politically. It is unsustainable. But on the other hand, 
the world and decent people throughout the world should understand that Israel is not such an extremist state as some want to pre pretend it is. Israelis open their hearts for peace three or four times. We tried it in 1993, we tried it in 2000, we tried it in 2008, and we tried it again now. Our extremist general leader, Eric Sharon, pulled out of the Gaza Strip, dismantled all settlements, no checkpoints. The results of all these attempts was not peace, but violence and turmoil. So Israelis are burned. They have very good reasons to be concerned about what to do next. Because even the ones who want to move forward are traumatized by the failure of previous ex ex uh, attempts. So these are the three regional issues that I think are combined with the challenge of where the West stands. And what's so troubling about the West and this is again why America is so important, is that we've seen two troubling phenomena. One is the fatigue caused by two wars and an economic crisis. This fatigue took the oxygen out of the room in many ways. I think that if we'd gone back today to 2000, before the wars and before the crisis, we would have seen a West that is much more determined and much more active in dealing with the threats of this wild Middle East. But because of this painful decade, we've lost a lot of the energy and stamina we had. The second problem, I think, is to people like me, the intellectuals, so to speak. I think that we have a deep problem of political correctness not letting us address the Middle East as it is. The fundamental phenomena is my mind is that because of political correctness, many of my friends, liberals, progressives in this country, in Europe and in Israel, have the mental difficulty to address third world evil. The criticism of the West is so deep and for some good reasons of America, of Israel, of the past, that many people find it difficult to address evil phenomena that come not from the West. But there are such phenomena. And 9-11 should have opened all our eyes to see how dangerous these phenomena can be. And in the 21st century, the combination of this kind of new extremism with new technologies, nuclear, biological, chemical, whatever you want, is probably the major challenge of the 21st century, of the first half of the 21st century. And we must change, get out of this intellectual weakness that we have to deal with these, these phenomena. So, am I pessimistic? No. I think the challenges are incredible. I think the times ahead are as challenging as ever. You can make the most dramatic historical comparisons and you will not be overstating. But why am I a believer? First of all, crises are opportunity. But I really believe in the deep strength of Israel, of Israelis, of Israeli society. And as I told you, I'm a deep believer in American strength, integrity, and decency. And I think this is especially appropriate to say that here in the heart of the Midwest. I think there is something that I've experienced in my visits to this city and a few others. There's something about basic, solid, decent America that I trust. America did wonders in the past, and if it takes the right steps and the right approach, I have no doubt of its ability to change and to deal with the challenges ahead. Basically, I think that what we should do regarding Gaza, that we just experienced this terrible war, we should really try to make the distinction between Hamas and the people of Gaza. 
We should be very tough not to allow them to rearm again. And the right direction is really demilitarization of Gaza in return for development project. I would call, say a Marshall Plan that really gives hope and life to the people of Gaza. Let us build power plants, water plants. Let them have a life there while being very rigid in the way we deal with their evil political leadership. Regarding ISIS, I think the key, the key here is not to make the mistake of creating an alliance that will strengthen other evil forces in the region. The only way to fight ISIS is to have a Sun, moderate Sunnis lead the battle against ISIS with American support. If God forbid we'll be tempted to create an alliance with Iran and Assad against ISIS, we will have a thousand ISIS's later on. Because let me see how the Sunni Arabs will see it. Because they do not know what political correctness is. They will see it as a Christian Shiite alliance against the Sunnis. And the result will be more extremism, more terror. So when America takes action in the coming weeks and months, this is the greatest warning sign, not to fall into that trap. If God forbid we'll forget about Iran or work with Iran, and we'll, we might help people that are far more dangerous. I, there's nothing more evil than ISIS, but there are others that are more dangerous. So we might have to be very cautious there. But the third, in my mind, the big project we should work on is a new peace concept. I am sadly, I do not believe that we can make peace in the Middle East in the way we wanted to do it in the 90s and even a few years ago. No moderate Arab has today enough legitimacy to sign a peace agreement with the Israelis. But so many moderate Arabs want to work with the Israelis and want to work with America because they are afraid of Iran and afraid of ISIS and afraid of the Islamic Brotherhood. If we will come up with a creative idea that works, brings a new kind of de facto peace process where Israel contributes, Palestinians contribute, com contribute, moderate Arabs contribute, and America leads all this. That will give the, some hope to the people of the Middle East, but that will always also enable America to lead in a way that does not drag you into wars. If you will build a construct that stabilizes the Middle East as much as possible, led by America, working with America's allies, rather than some of America's enemies. That would be the right way to give some hope and some stability to a deeply unstable region. So let me say this as we must end now. I really think, and I do not only say it because I stand with you good people, that America gave hope to civilization when hope was lost. And then, America saved the world in World War I, and in World War II, and in preventing World War III. America gave the world its most peaceful, stable century. Definitely the 60, 70 years since World War II. There is no other one to do this kind of work in the 21st century. So some things have changed. This fundamental factor did not change. So as an Israeli who owes so much to America, as a person who loves America so much, but mainly as a citizen of the free world, I ask you, as Americans, and I ask America, please, please lead. Thank you very much. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we are listening to a Friday Forum featuring Annisfeld Wolf Book Award winner Ari Shavit, author of My Promised Land, The Triumph and Tragedy of Israel. We'll return to our speaker momentarily for our traditional City Club question and answer period. And we would ask that you start formulating your questions now, that you avoid speeches during those questions and actually structure your uh, questions as such. We welcome all of you here and those joining us via 90.3 WCPN, 
WVIZ PBS, 104.9 WCLV Idea Stream, or one of the many radio stations across the region and country that carry City Club programs. Television bro broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC, and our live webcasts are supported by the University of Akron. On Friday, September 19, the City Club welcomes Jamie Bennett, Executive Director of Art Place America, as part of our Arts by Design series, supported in part by the residents of Cuyahoga County through a public grant from Cuyahoga Arts and Culture. Now, for more information about all of our past and upcoming City Club programs, please visit our website at www.cityclub.org. Today's program is the Karen Faith Witt and A.H. Weinstein Memorial Forum on the Persecution of Peoples, made possible by generous gifts from the late Dale Solly in memory of his friend Karen Faith Witt, and from Norman Weinstein in memory of his father, A.H. Weinstein. We thank you very much for your support. And today we welcome tables hosted by Baker and Hostetler, the Cleveland Foundation, Cleveland State University, and guest of Tancer Giesler. We thank you all for your support. And now, as promised, we will return to our speaker for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone here today, including guests. Holding the microphones today are Director of Programming, Stephanie Jansky. There's Stephanie, and Marketing and Outreach Specialist, Kirsten Pianca. First question, please. Welcome. Thank you. I'm impressed by your reference to the Marshall Plan, to working with moderate Arabs, and in other ways, adverting to the need to foster economic and political development within groups that, within nations, within groups that may trouble us. And I bring you a tiny piece of good news from Iran, where I spent two and a half weeks one year ago. During my time there, which was very pleasant, on a tour, I did not encounter a single hostile word, though I was manifestly American. And what I did see was a generation of Iranians growing in a, with much independent-minded feelings. Conservative, older people too. But I think I, I ask you to, uh, if you have hope that, that there is a chance of Iran changing from within, uh, because I wonder how else we're going to have them back away from a nuclear force, I don't see it happening militarily. Um, I'm, I'm a great believer in the Iranian people. This is why the Iran challenge and the Iran question is so tricky. Because sadly, when you look at the Middle East, again with sober eyes, what you see is that the really functioning nation states are the three non-Arab ones, Turkey, Israel, and Iran, with all their flaws, but relatively to everything that's happening elsewhere. Iran has a deep civilization, very talented people. I have deep respect for them, and I have no doubt that long-term, 2020, 2030, 2050, Iranians will get rid of this religious dictatorship that they have. And long-term, Iran will be a partner for America, will be a partner for us. The only obstacle is the bomb. And it's a huge obstacle. Because if the Iranians will acquire nuclear capability, that will give a life expectancy to this regime for decades, and it will be able to change the Middle East and control large parts of the Middle East before it changes itself. So it is crucial in my mind, also for the future of the Iranians, the good, decent Iranians, that I do have hope for and I know what's going on there with the youngsters, with the women, there's a lot of underlying hope. The only problem 
is that I remember I've been following the Iran issue for 20 years. And we were promised every year that next year we will be saved by the Iranians. And the Iranians are a bit slow in saving us and themselves from this regime. And again, I'm not into blame games, but the greatest opportunity that was the opportunity of June 2009, when the Iranians rebelled against the regime in many ways and wanted it. This was before the Arab Spring. Before the Arab Spring, we had the Persian Spring. Sadly, we did not seize the opportunity. That was one moment when American interests and American values were totally coherent with each other. But we all failed to seize that golden opportunity. So sadly, and if you follow what's really going on, not just the people in the street, the regime is right now getting stronger. They are stronger than they were a year ago. Their economy is still weak, but it's not that bad if you've been there. And if we will not change course. Now, I really hope and pray that by November we'll have a good deal with Iran. I agree with you that the only solution is a political solution. My claim is that we need very assertive diplomacy. And let me tell you how the Iranians see it. The Iranians believe the West is rotten and weak and does not have the willpower. I don't think that Iran is Nazi Germany, although it can be very, very dangerous, but there is no doubt that they treat the West like the Germans saw the Western democracies of the 30s. The way they see it, the democracies are weak, soft, and they outsmart them, outsmart us. And sadly, the record is on their side. Every American president and every Israeli prime minister was committed not to have Iran where it is today, with 20,000 centrifuges, and they want 50,000, and they are replacing them with these sophisticated. They are very ambitious people. They will not be in New North Korea. The, when they get the bomb, they'll have 50 bombs, and they'll have intercontinental missiles threatening Cleveland. So again, I don't think that they'll use them the next day, but that will be a different world. So let us open our eyes. Part of the problem we have, I would say, in democracies as good people, that we sometimes are late to respond to danger. And we are late on Iran. As I said, Iran is a challenge to our civilization. So far, it's a failure of our civilization. It was so easy to deal with Iran, and not in a military way. In 2003, 2005, 2007, it's getting more and more difficult. But it's still not too late, but it might be too late tomorrow. One of the very few groups in the Middle East that is cohesive and that appears to be at least opposed to the extremists are the Kurds. Yet U.S. support in the form, whether it's military or allowing them to sell oil and use the proceeds as they wish, uh, is going to run into a few problems with their neighbors, particularly Turkey. Are the Kurds a moderate force that would be our ally if properly supported? Definitely so. Again, as I say, I can add the Kurds to this somewhat sad, to, to the bright side of the sad phenomenon I described. Of, when you look at what happened with the Arab Spring, and again, I'm, I'm, I ask us all to remember what was the state of mind in this country and elsewhere regarding Tahrir Square in February 2011. It's not ancient history. It's three and a half years ago. We were all so naive. We really believed that that Google guy will be the president of Egypt. <laughs> but what you've seen in these three years is that almost no decent Arab has it better than he had it before. Muammar Gaddafi is not a hero of mine. But life in Libya is worse now even than under Gaddafi. Syria, 200,000 people have died. I mean, it was bad before, but it's horrific now. We, we are facing a human catastrophe. 
It's a human catastrophe. Now, with on, within all that, the two glimmers of light are one, Tunisia. Tunisia is the only Arab country that something better is happening than before. I, it's fragile. We don't know what will happen. And the other thing is Kurdistan, the Kurds. The Kurds are very impressive in many, many ways. Mm -hmm. So yes, definitely the Kurds are a great ally for America, for Israel. I, I think that the new distinction, look, to work, part of the problem, part of the issue, again, that democracies having in, have in dealing with such a region is that there are no good guys, okay? There are no Canadians in the Middle East. <laughs> so, so, so you have two options. Either you opt out and you say, you know, I'm a purist, I remain, I don't touch it because it's all contaminated. <coughs> or you say, you know, it's a rough world out there. Doing, promoting the lesser evil is doing the right thing and indirectly happen, helping the worst evil is immoral. So I think that the distinction should be not between moderates and extremists because that's complicated. It's stabilizers and destabilizers. America should lead a coalition and alliance of stabilizers, of those. Now, the stabilizers, again, they are not perfect. There are no Mother Theresa's. But, you know, Jordan is better than Syria. And, and if this kind of alliance emerges, the Kurds are very, very important because there something is happening that is really promising. I would say that the one part of Iraq where the Iraq war succeeded is Kurdistan. It failed on all other aspects. But Kurdistan is better. So yes, this is a great example of the kind of forces we should be working with them and in order to create this somewhat better Middle East. Ari, right, thank you so much for joining us here today. I want to come back to your book. The most arresting and affecting chapter in it, I found, was the chapter that's probably the most personal to you that recounts your experience as a paratrooper in the IDF. Um, that chapter revealed a level of complicity in the whole enterprise with respect to Palestinians and their torture. Because of the compulsory nature of military service in Israel, that complicity is a shared experience, not 100%, but by many. How does that complicate the peace process? And how does that complicate the political dialogue among you and your countrymen? Well, first of all, you know, different people have different approaches to what is the most uh, sensitive or what is the best chapter and so on. And I'll say something about that. I'll take the opportunity to tell you what I think, what I think is the most important chapter. <laughs> but, I won't, but, 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 I won't, but I won't avoid the question. I mean, you, you referred to, to if, if there was anyone here who didn't read the book, uh, uh, to, to a chapter uh, which I wrote almost, actually this is something that was published before, that was wrote almost in real time, 19, in the early 90s. I served uh, as a reservist, as a guard in a, in a prison, in a detention camp in Gaza, actually. Uh, and I describe the, the terrible experience of, of, of you know, going to defi defend my country and finding myself uh, uh, being a jailer. And I go through the entire, all, all the emotions. On the one hand, you know, criticizing my country, understanding it. You know, it's a very schizophrenic chapter, like large parts of the book, but this one specific. <laughs> um, so let me say one thing. First thing is that, thank God, these detention, camp, detention camps are not with us anymore. So there are still terrible things happening. But this has to do with what I said about the benign side of Israel. Because when I wrote, without noticing it, but when I wrote that chapter in the early 90s, I was probably part of some sort of zeitgeist in Israel that said we would not have this anymore. And this is why we went with the support of an Israeli majority to Oslo. And this is why we brought Yasser Arafat back. And again, I, I remind people, because I think I expressed enough of my, 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 my admiration for your country, but I do not remember that America ever came to terms with Fidel Castro. Yasser Arafat was a thousand times more radioactive for us than Fidel Castro. 
And we did that. No one gives us the credit anymore. Middle of the road, sometimes right-wing Israelis who went along with the process that brought someone so radioactive back to Gaza. So we tried to deal with that issue of occupation as it was. And the results are so mixed. I mean, on the one hand, I think it's so good that we have less of that old kind of occupation. There is people of Gaza are not under our control, and the people in the West Bank are under indirect control. But, but actually, many of them are under direct Palestinian authority. So when I wrote that, that expressed something about middle Israel realizing we cannot do this thing anymore. Now again, I want to remind you that some of the democracies I admire have some other detention camps in some islands not far from their shores. The difference is that Israel, because it's a, it's, it's a different kind of military uh, uh, organization that is so wide and, and really expresses Israeli democracy in many ways, so many people are encounter it. It's not like a few professionals who do the dirty work that's needed for national security. Many people are exposed to that. Bottom line, on the one hand, I will not pretend that everything is perfect in Israel. My book is about the imperfection of Israel, but how remarkable and wondrous is Israel is, although it has so many flaws and problems. We are no saints. We are humans. I think that many of us are rather remarkable humans, and our story is a remarkable human story. But that story is part of the dark side when we made the mistake, in my mind, of getting, into, getting caught up in occupation. There was something impressive about our attempt to end occupation. It all failed. And the challenge, as I said, is to find the new ways of dealing with it. So if I can finish here what I didn't finish before, I think that the way forward is for us to work with the moderate Palestinians in order to give them more future. I said some things about Gaza, but my hope regarding the Palestinians in the West Bank is the Fayyad phenomenon. Salam Fayyad is my Palestinian hero. He's the one Palestinian who really cared about his own people, about their education, their health. I think we should be working with people. He's, not, he's now out of office. I hope he'll be back. By the way, that's one of America's few great successes in the last decade, but then it faltered because he's gone. But we should bring back such Palestinians. And then if we have a process where without a formal peace agreement, without solving all the great issues, we will take steps that are in the right direction, creating two state dynamics. And there will be Palestinians on the other side who build up their economy, their nations, step by step. If the Saudis and the Gulf countries will at last support their brothers not only in war but in peace and actually fund these projects, I think you, have, you can have the outline of a beginning of some sort of realistic hope because I do believe there is, we have dark forces in Israel. We do have dark forces. But I think we have a decent, solid, moderate, potential majority that, as I said, was traumatized by the failures of the past. If we have a new and more realistic kind of approach, I believe we can move forward so no Israeli will ever have to be again a jailer of Palestinians. And, and, and later, I'll find a way to d describe the chapter I like most. So. <laughs> Mr. Shavit. What? Sorry, I, I, I will not Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for your book, which I learned a lot from, and your t addressing controversial issues. I want to ask your opinion about two uh, actions which seem to be collective punishment in the West Bank following the June uh, kidnapping and murder of the three Israeli teenagers. The first was the arrest by the IDF of some 1,000 uh, Palestinians in the West Bank. And the second was the recent uh, announcement by the Israeli government of uh, taking a uh, 1,000 some thousand acres of uh, land, farming land, in the area of Gush Etzion. So thank you for your question. Um, I think there is a world of difference between the two incidents you described. Uh, the first, let, let me 
be begin with, with, with the second, actually. I, I think, and you know, as Israel is a democracy, uh, and we are very vocal in our criticism at home. I'll be somewhat more uh, uh, restrained in my criticism of my government when I'm abroad, but I will share with you my opinion that I think this was an incomprehensible mistake. Uh, it was a very delicate moment. We somehow survived this terrible summer. And this was the moment to say where we are heading. Are we reaching out? Are we being generous? Are we trying to now to move forward? OK, we were attacked. We were challenged. We had to use force. It was not pleasant. So now we have to say, who are we? So this was the moment to prove that we want peace, even if it's far away and it'll take time. This was the time to show that we care about the other people. This was the time to show our best face. And rather, they went for this step, which even if legally, you know, no personal land was confiscated and so on, there are many excuses. But what's the message? Do we need more settlements? Is this what will make us stronger? Our major problem is the lack, the deficit of our international legitimacy. The greatest threat to Israel is the erosion of our deep alliance with the West. Do we want to erode this more? I go around this country and wherever I speak and try to tell the story, the amazing story of how amazing Israel is. But as long as we keep settling and take land, no one listens. The only way to bring out, and I'm such a believer in Israel, I think the Zionist revolution was the most just, astounding revolutions of the 20th century. I think Israel is, and I say it only, not only as an Israeli, as a Jew, I think that in universal terms, there is a moral imperative to have a home for the homeless people. Israel is wondrous in so many ways. So why spoil it with taking some acres of land? Why spoil it with these more settlements? What does it give us? So I was deeply saddened by this. And I'm sure that there are many Israelis even who took the decision, who knew how stupid it was and took it because of all kinds of politics. Because as I said the other day, I think we have amazing people, an amazing Israeli society. We have horrific politics, worse than yours. <laughs> so, and, and that's a difficult and, and I think it's these dynamics of silly, petty politics within Israel that led to this step. And my greatest wish is really that we'll find a way to find our way and, and go back to a sensible policy which is always combines strength, realism, knowing there are so many enemies around us, knowing we are challenged and endangered like no other democracy, but knowing that we must be moral and just while we fight. We are at the end of the day the Jewish people is a small, lonely people. And the Jewish state is a vulnerable state. It must be democratic. It must be just. I'd say to my fellow Israelis, we are no China. We cannot do Tibet. We are no Russia. We cannot do Ukraine. We must have the moral high ground. We succeeded in a miraculous way over 100 years by always maintaining the moral high ground. In 1937, we accepted the partition plan, and this is why we won the political battle. In 1947, we accepted the UN resolution. The Arabs rejected it. This is why we won the 48 war. In 2000, we reached out to peace, and this is why we survived the Second Intifada. When we do not do that, we, we, we don't do the right thing, we are not only making a, a, a mistake regarding the others, we are endangering ourselves. There is no, for us, being just is essential. Again, just and tough. We must be tough. And our great leader, David Ben-Gurion, knew that. He was tough as nail when it came to take action, when we were really 
challenged and attacked. But he always maintained that before that, we must have morality on our side. So I'm almost desperate when I see this kind of move by our government. But as I said, I am a believer. Most Israelis are not there. I published an op-ed the other day. I really believe that 60, 70 percent of Israelis are reasonable and moderate. What they want is not some, they don't have some nationalistic ambitions. They are not extremists. Basically what they want is an Israeli version of the American dream. They want Israel to be as American as possible. They have a middle class dream. They want a nice house with the lawn, with some quiet. They want, and combined with decency and, and the values of freedom. We are talking of free speech, a very free society with astoundingly free speech. So I believe that if we'll find a way to translate this yearning of the Israeli majority into a new political reality, we will not have such moves as this uncalled for move. And yet, just referring to your fir the first part of the question, I think that when three of our young boys were kidnapped, there was justification to take action. And actually, I have a lot of criticism of my prime minister. I think he deserves a medal for the restraint he showed during this summer. As I said this morning elsewhere, if it weren't for Iron Dome, and if it weren't for the leadership of, of this government, again, that I'm not a fan of, we would have ended up in a catastrophic war. The Iron People engineers deserve a Nobel Prize for peace. If it wasn't for them and for a restrained Israeli policy, we would have had to conquer Gaza with hundreds of our boys getting killed and thousands of Palestinians getting killed and the peace agreements with Egypt and Jordan endangered. And who knows what would have happened throughout the world. So we were saved with all the, the atrocities, all the, all the horrific scenes we saw this summer. We were saved from a much larger uh, catastrophe. And I think Israelis should get a credit. When they do do the right thing, they should get the credit, something that not always happened. So I... <laughs> so to give me my minute? Okay. Huh? okay. Thank you very much. Well, we didn't have enough time, so. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we have been enjoying a Friday Forum featuring Annisfeld Wolf Book Award winner Ari Shavit, author of My Promised Land, The Triumph and Tragedy of Israel. Thank you very much, Mr. Shavit. Sorry, again, we didn't have more time. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. <laughs>